Um, help us to really receive a better picture of who you are from these portions in Ezekiel. Help us to just receive from you tonight and apply it wherever you see fit that you were not return void. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So Ezekiel is still dealing with his fellow captives. His fellow captives. Doing his fellow captives who are insisting that God will not destroy Jerusalem. They said he could never do that. And the attitude is like, if God did that, he'd be breaking his covenant. And Ezekiel's goal is, is to point out that, no, God has to destroy it to keep his covenant. Because that was the covenant that was made with Moses. It's the covenant they made. And so he has two examples here. We're going to look at chapter 15 and 16. Chapter 15 is the shortest chapter in Ezekiel. Chapter 16 is the longest. And it's two examples from God's perspective. And <clears throat> remember, we, he had just finished explaining that even if a great, if there was one or two great people left in Israel, God was still going to destroy it. Whether it was, you know, Noah, Daniel, or Job. Remember how, you know, and Daniel, I wanted to mention last time, an example of someone who, instead of caving to a pagan culture, actually changed it. You know, Daniel, who was at this time kind of a celebrity, he was pretty famous for having been promoted to head magi. And he was, you know, Jewish kid done good in Babylon. It's easy to imagine a Jewish person saying, I believe God and God's not going to destroy Israel no matter what happens, no matter how many times Babylon attacks us, because I trust God. And this could be a beautiful moment for faith, except God had already declared that Jerusalem would be destroyed. So faith cannot be in my own hopes. Faith cannot be in my own faith as we see in a lot of American Christianity, faith is always in God's word. Mm -hmm. So chapter 15, Ezekiel, and the word of the Lord came unto me saying, son of man, what is the vine tree more than any tree or a branch which is among the trees of the forest? So we're talking about vines. Um, there's four different types of plants that God uses to, um, they're metaphors for Israel. And um, olive tree is often used as a covenantal statement, relationship between uh, Yahweh and Israel. Fig tree often speaks of Israel as a national sin. Remember, <coughs> remember Christ, yeah. Remember Christ, um, cursed the fig tree when it didn't have fruit. And the disciples were a little confused because it wasn't time for fruit. And Jesus said, no, Israel should have known who I was, and they didn't. They should have, been, they should have known the scriptures. Um, the vine speaks to the spiritual relationship between Israel and Yahweh. It's in Isaiah 5 and Hosea 10 talks about that. A vine, the vine becomes a symbol for Christ, as in the, shoot, uh, the, the root of Jesse or shoot. And, of course, Christ himself claimed to be the vine. So Christ, as a spiritual vine, represents the spiritual life between us and God. So with that vine in mind, the question here is, what good is a vine if there's no fruit? It's talking about, is there a difference between the, the wood of a vine tree or a branch of any other tree in the forest? So imagine a little piece of vine, that little stem. Is that wood different from the wood of a regular tree? And of course, yes. Can you take that wood, verse three, to do any work with it? Is that wood worth anything? Will men take a pin out of it, hang in your vessel? Can you use the wood from a vine and um, make a hanger on the wall, hang your hat or your coat or a picture from it, a peg? You know. And the point is, is that the wood from a vine is absolutely worthless. The vine itself, there's nothing to it unless there's life going through it, and unless there's fruit. Behold, verse four, it's cast into the fire for fuel. I can't use a piece of vine to do construction work. I can't make beams out of it. I can't, I can't even make a peg to hold a hat. 
and it says, if, if fire for fuel, the fire devours both ends of it and the mist is burned. Is it meat for anywhere? Is it useful for anything? Is the vine useful? It burns at both ends. Yeah, I guess it could be thrown in the fire, but it burns so fast, it's not really worth that. Both ends come together. And as a metaphor, this is talking about the north and south ends of Israel, you know, between Babylon and Egypt. There's nothing there. The point is a vine is worthless without fruit. A vine is worthless without any, without it functioning as meant to function. Behold, when it was whole, it was meat, it was food for no work. Even when it was together, you couldn't use it to build anything. How much less is it meat for any work when the fire has devoured it and it is burned? You know, a big chunk of wood when you burn it, maybe the leftover piece could still be have some strength to it. it could be artwork it could be some purpose for it but a vine is nothing therefore thus says the lord god as the vine tree among the trees of the forest which have given to the fire for fuel so will i give the inhabitants of jerusalem so there's no spiritual life left in israel Therefore, there is no fruit left in Israel. Therefore, the only good thing that the vine can be used for is to be burnt up. So that is reason number one why I'm going to destroy Jerusalem. There's, there's no fruit. I've had plenty of warning. Therefore, I will set my face against them. They shall go out from one fire, and another fire shall devour them. So as they run, as they run from this part of the city that's burning, they'll be running into another part that's burning. There's no escape. Again, Ezekiel is clarifying to his listeners that stop saying that God's going to save Jerusalem. It is too late. The match has been lit. It's when the ball is rolling. There's nothing you can do about it. And of course, for us today, we are engaged in sharing the grace and love and mercy of Jesus Christ because there is a tribulation time coming. There is a time when anybody that has rejected Christ will be left behind. Mm -hmm. And the planet will be answering the question, what is God supposed to do when mercy is rejected? Verse 8, and I will make the land desolate because they have committed a trespass, says the Lord God. So once again, if you commit a trespass, the wages of sin is death. Stop saying that God's going to rescue Jerusalem or not destroy Israel. It is over. So imagine someone says, yeah, but God can't do that. No, um, Jerusalem, that's his baby. Jerusalem, he made a promise to Abraham, right? So chapter 16 is a God's eye view on this. And I guess the best title for it is the unfaithful wife of Yahweh. So he's going to present his picture of specifically Jerusalem, but by, by extension, Israel as well. And he's basically going to, I guess the best way to say this, he's asking the question to these men, how would you feel if your wife did this? Okay. And this chapter is rough. This chapter is going to have some very sordid, ugly things about fornication, adultery, harlotry, murder, all sorts of exciting PG stuff, and um, not suitable for children. And you may think a couple of things I'm saying, I'm, I'm being salacious, like trying to get a charge out of it. In this particular chapter, it's not the case. In this chapter, God is applying shock value. This is God being a shock jock. This is God saying, okay, you want to skip the real picture, real ugliness. This is what it looks like to me. Uh, this chapter in the Mishnah by Eliezer Ben Hircanus said this chapter should never be read in public. Okay. <laughs> so we're in private, so it's okay. <laughs> well, this one you had to read in church. It says it should not be read or commented on in public. And it's it's, you know, yeah. That we, you're all familiar with certain verses here, but some of these things are just, you know, they're, they're rough. They're blushing, and I'm going to say them. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. Let Jerusalem see what she's really like. Jerusalem. And say, thus says the Lord God in Jerusalem, your birth and your nativity is of the land of Canaan. 
your father was a hit Amorite and your mother a Hittite. Well, this is just plain nasty. Mm -hmm. Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem. Um, he's, he's saying nasty things about Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, historically, before Israel showed up, it was the Jebusite stronghold. And in fact, it remained that until David conquered it. But historically, the Amorites, Jebusites were a branch of them as far as a people group. But Hittites, of course, was the, they were like the governing, I mean, they, they dealt with all the land deeds and promises. Remember, Abraham made deals with Hittites. And of course, the fun thing about Hittites was that skeptics all throughout the centuries of church history have mocked the Bible because Hittites didn't really exist until they were discovered by Dr. Gilbert Wright, 1872, which is reasonably recent. And all of a sudden, as always, the Bible was proven to be true. Um, in Genesis 15, 16, when God is making the promise to Abraham, he talks about how in the fourth generation, the Israelites will be freed from Egypt. And at that time, they will be able to wage war on the Amorites. He says, he says, right now, the children of Israel will come hither again for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So there's a timetable in God's plan for when the Canaanites will be destroyed because of their wickedness. And of course, what God is saying is you become as bad as them. And if I had destroyed them when they didn't know any better, you definitely have a problem when you do know better. Plus, we made a covenant. Yeah. So, <clears throat> as for thy, thy nativity, when you were born, in the day you were born, your navel was not cut. Neither were you washed in water to suckle thee, and you were not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. This is a picture of a newborn baby that had the umbilical just cut and left to bleed out in the open field. That's what you were like, Jerusalem, when I found you. So you were just a, you know, Canaanite city. You have absolutely no value. And remember the previous one, you have no value unless I'm with you. Jesus said, I'm the vine. And do nothing without me. So it's kind of the same message, but this is a lot more graphic. It says you were out there, you weren't you weren't washed, you weren't salted. Um, salt was rubbed to smooth out the body and clean all the fluid off in in birthing, or not swaddled. Nothing wrapped you, nobody hold held you. No eye, verse five, pitied you to do any of these things unto you, to have compassion on you, but you were cast out in the open field to the loathing of, you, of your person in the day that you were born. A couple other prophets, Isaiah and Hosea, talk about the history of Israel like a poetic sense. That's what this is. This is a poem about Israel's history. And they often say, you were beautiful until you betrayed me. Ezekiel goes back to long before, like, the marriage between Israel and God. And he, he never once, he, he doesn't present a time at all when Israel was faithful. And if you think about it, they never were because as soon as they got the commandment, they went out on him and they with the golden calf. Mm -hmm. So that's just been their nature. And they said, when I passed by you and saw you polluted in your own blood, verse six, I said unto you, when you, were in, when you were in your blood, live. Yea, I said unto you, when you're in your own blood, live. This phrase is repeated twice. This is the God of creation looking at something that is, I'm not going to say worthless, but useless and dying and unwanted and, and declaring live. Well, that's what God does. He's the God of creation. When he says light, light happens. When he said live, he said <clears throat> live. I have caught, and now I have caused you to multiply as the bud of the field, and you have increased and waxed great. So, as a baby, Jerusalem needs protection from the elements, it needs protection from the wolves and strangers. And so, God rescued her. Okay. And now she grew up, she blossomed. He said, I've increased and waxed and great, and you have now become excellent ornaments. Your breasts have grown and your hair has grown. This is talking about pubescent hair. This is talking about maturity, at which point now a young woman needs protection from other things. Okay. 
um, protection from the elements first thing, but now you've turned into a beautiful young woman and you've matured and you've grown. But remember, you were naked and bare. So the message for all of us is to always remember where we came from. The Bible says, um, I think I wrote it up here. I still wanted to focus on just. Um, verse 1 Corinthians 4 7. What do you have that you did not receive? Okay. Just anything we have came from God, and outside of that, we are that baby. Mm -hmm. So that's for our own personal application. So, verse 8 I passed by you and looked upon you, and behold, the time was a time of love. Okay, now you're mature, you're a young woman. No, the reason you became a beautiful young woman is because I saved you in the first place. But now I protected you again. I covered my skirt or I spread my skirt over you and covered you. Remember Ruth 3.9, Boaz covered the skirt. This is the hem. This is a declaration of protection. You're under my protection, okay? Nothing sorted there. And he's just saying that, okay, I protected you. You became part of my family and we we're married. Okay, well, the marriage, we talked about that. If you were in any of the um, Exodus classes, the marriage of Yahweh, this is his bride. And again, the question is, what would you do if your bride did this? Okay. It was a time of love. I put my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. And I swore unto you and entered into a covenant with you, says the Lord God, and you became mine. Then I washed you with water covered you with my word, and I thoroughly washed away the blood from you and rinsed you with oil. I clothed you also with broidered work, shod you with badger skins, girded you with fine linen, and covered you with silk. This word silk, it's not sure what it really means, but it obviously means very, very expensive. Everything else in those, in this verse here, in that two verses, are um, elements from the tabernacle. He's saying badger skin, that's the King James. This is probably the sea manatee, maybe dolphin skin. It was common, very, very durable. It happens to be what their shoes were made out of during the wilderness when it didn't wear out. And it's one of the coverings for the tabernacle. And so God is saying, I gave you all these things to cover you, protect you. And when we think of the tabernacle being synonymous with Christ, he's saying, I gave you the sun to cover you, protect you. I covered you with silk. I decked you also with ornaments. And I put bracelets upon your hands and a chain around on your neck. I just gave you all sorts of jewelry. And of course, these things were also in the tabernacle, ornaments, gold. And I put a jewel on thy forehead and earrings in your ears. Forehead really actually means nose. So beautiful, beautiful nose. And earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown upon your head. So this, this baby girl has come a long way. This is the idea that God is saying that I did this to you, Israel. This, again, so this whole thing is a metaphor. It's, a, it's, it's poetic about the life of Jerusalem and, and Israel, but um, it contains real things here. So I put jewels on your forehead, earrings and ears, and a crown upon your head. I gave you everything. And you were decked with gold and silver. Your raiment was of fine linen and silk and broidered work. And you ate fine flour, honey, and oil. And you were exceedingly beautiful. And thou didst prosper into a kingdom. You became a, a major, major nation. Israel, you became a nation. Jerusalem, you became the capital. And the wonders of Solomon. Think mm -hmm. about that. And... <clears throat> But you had nothing. Think about a brand new nation that has, has nothing in terms of culture, nothing in terms of history, nothing in terms of civilization. God made it from scratch. The whole culture and civilization from the, from the, from the Torah created what we use today as a model for civilization. You know, personal rights, protecting individuals, protecting workers, protect, you know, protecting property rights. All those things come from the Bible, not any other kingdom. And verse 14, in your renown, your fame went forth among the heathen for your beauty. And it was perfect through my comeliness. 
which I put upon thee, says the Lord God. And God says, you became famous for your beauty, but your beauty was because of me. It was my comeliness that made you beautiful. Ever had somebody that really, really loves being around you and you start realizing it's Christ they like and not you? Mm-hmm. And you're thankful for it. <laughs> you go, yeah, yeah. It, you're, you're, you're just exuding Christ. You're, you're presenting life to them and they love being around you and you're afraid they might see the real you until you realize the real you is who you are in Christ. Always remember that. Mm-hmm. And of course, there are going to be people that don't like you and that no reason at all other than you exude Christ. You know, because people will respond very actively to Jesus Christ. They must make a decision. So, okay, here's the problem. Verse 15, but you did trust in your own beauty. This is the fall of Satan, except this is Jerusalem and Israel doing that. You trusted in your own beauty and played the harlot because of your renown, because of your fame, and you poured out fornications on everyone that passed by. His it was. But we're going to have this picture here um, of how Israel begins to play the harlot. Now, if God is the husband and Israel is the wife, these are the sort of things his wife's been doing. And we're going to go through different levels here. Want to go from a wife that cheats on her husband to a wife, um, a wife that cheats because other men are seducing her, to a wife that goes out actively to seduce others, and eventually one that is so, so trapped by insatiable lust that they just will sleep with anything and anyone that moves. That is the picture that God is going to be portraying. Here we go. But then it gets worse. So he said, verse 16, and of your garments thou didst take and deck the high places with diverse colors. So the garments that I gave you, but these are the garments from the tabernacle. People took the garments from the tabernacle or the coverings, the spiritual coverings, and you took those and you put them on the high places. These would be high places throughout the Old Testament talks about the large pillars for different idols, different gods, uh, the groves. And so you were using things that I gave you. You, gave, you took the wealth and prosperity that I gave you and used it to dress up other gods. And you played the harlot there. Harlot here is stronger than whore. Okay. Whore is someone that sleeps for money. Harlot is someone that sleeps around, as we'll see later, doesn't even care about the money. The like things shall not come, and it shall not be so. This is not something that should have happened. Verse 17, also you have taken fair jewels of my gold and my silver, which I gave you, and made to thyself images of men. Images of men were large phallic symbols. These are things that the different gods required, and women would carry these things around and use them in different types of ceremonies. And um, and you committed a whoredom with them. So once again, yes, the metaphor is stepping out on your marriage with God, but this was also real licentious living. And you took the broidered garments and covered them. You took them and covered other things with them. And you set my oil and my incense before them. Again, all these things that I gave you. Mm-hmm. You can Let's think about this. This is not God now. Let's think about. You probably heard this in a movie where some husband who's not a nice guy says, I made you and look what you did, right? I rescued you, right? I made you a star, you know, just a typical grade B movie picture there. And God's kind of doing this, except he really did do it. He is the one that took them from nothing. And so after, imagine God gives gifts and they're without repentance. And then people use those gifts to honor other gods or to seek other activities to, to go out on God. Yes. And he says, fine flower. Um, you took a bird of garments and you put incense. My meat, the food which I gave you, the fine flower oil and honey that I fed you with, you set them before them for a sweet savor. And thus it was, says the Lord God. Offerings that were supposed to be mine, 
that I gave you, you're giving them to other gods. Moreover, you have taken your sons and daughters whom, you, whom thou hast born unto me, and thou hast sacrificed unto them to be devoured. So we're moving from idolatry and adultery to murder. He says, the children that I gave you, the offspring that I gave you, you're sacrificed unto other gods. This is referring to Moloch and other child sacrifice activities that they were doing. In, in, uh, is this of thy whoredoms a small matter? In other words, do you think this is a small deal? Question, maybe you can see why judgment has to come. You're seeing this from God's perspective now. God is saying, I did all this for you, and you're going to use all the gifts I gave you to go out on me. But it gets worse. Verse 21. Then you have slain my children and delivered them to cause them to pass through the fire for them. Again, this is Moloch, pass through the fire of Moloch worship. In all your abominations and whoredoms, thou hast not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare and was polluted in your blood. And that's something we probably don't need to spend time dwelling on. Every once in a while, it's important for us to remember where we came from, where we were saved from. And the more we understand our original depravity, you know, total depravity, that's the human nature, the uh, more we can rest in and, and, and pure joy at being rested by God. You know, that's who we all were. We were all that discarded, unwanted. You know, there was no place for us and God rescued us. God took us out of sin. God took us out of ourselves. And God has given us life. He's given us joy. He's given us purpose. And it's good not to forget that. You did not remember the days of your youth. When you were adorning your Verse 23. And it, and it came to pass after all thy wickedness, woe, woe unto thee, says the Lord God. So this is God saying, okay, after all this wickedness, now I'm going to tell you what you're really doing wrong. It's, it's, it's much worse than you think. Woe, woe. This is talking about woe to the past things, woe for what I'm talking about in the future. Which reminds me of the three woes in Revelation. Final three, final three judgments. Um, these two woes here, the idea is woe that this happened and woe what's going to happen. It's a declaration of both sorrow and coming judgment. Verse 24, that you have also built unto thee an eminent place and made thee a high place in every street. In other words, you put idols and shrines on every street, high places. Jerusalem is covered with shrines. We're going to be going from, they took up the gods of Egypt and Canaan. But now, it turns out, they've been taking up gods from other places, too. I'm going to kind of, ex it expands on that. Whoa, wait, there's more. Um, the glory of Israel in the time of Solomon is, up to the time of Solomon, this is what was still going on. But since Solomon, the degradation has gotten much worse. And that's, this is a breaking point here for continuing on in the history of Israel. Verse 25, thou hast built your high place every head of the way. You know, every street corner, every public park. And you has made your beauty to be abhorred. Abhorred. So imagine a beautiful woman who starts selling herself, and she suddenly is not so pretty anymore, okay? You just get used up. You get burnt out. This is just, you know, so, yeah. And it becomes a mockery of what you were. And it says, <clears throat> you have made your beauty to be abhorred and has opened thy feet to everyone that passed by. This is simply mean you spread your legs. This is all you do, you know. What used to be cheating on your husband now is actively going out there and just I don't care who it is. I'm just, it's, I mean, yeah, there's a lust aspect to this. Like, like Jerusalem is insatiable. Just cannot help. It has to go out and doesn't care who walks by. 
When you open your feet, that's what that means, spread your legs to those that pass by and multiply their whoredoms. You committed fornication with the Egyptians, your neighbors, great of flesh. Once again, that phrase means huge members. This is like, whatever you're thinking, that's what it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. That you're just like, you're just going around and looking for any guy that can, can satisfy you. And the Egyptians, you're going down there and they're great of flesh and you increased your whoredoms. You're provoking me to anger. Therefore, behold, verse 27, I have stretched out my hand over you and have diminished your ordinary food and deliver them into the will of them that hate you. The daughters of the Philistines, which are ashamed of your lewd ways. Now, to be called a Canaanite is pretty bad. That's just, they, that, that's just an insult. Um, to be told you're a whore and harlot and this and that. To be told the Philistines are embarrassed by you. This is a new low. Now, one of the reasons the Philistines are unique in this, this passage, and one more time mm -hmm. in the chapter, is what God is saying is that Philistines have their God. Remember Dagon? Mm -hmm. uh, some sort of sea type of entity that fell over in the when the ark was in his presence. Yeah. Um, so, well, they have their God, but at least they're faithful to their God. They don't go stepping out on Dagon and go looking for every other country's gods. You know, so the Philistines are going, what is wrong with these Israelites? They have a really great God. We've learned to respect that God. We don't mess with their God. And now there's, because every nation had their own main God. And it was a contest between the gods when they went to war. And so it's, that's your champion, right? So it's disgraceful. You look across at those Israelites and they, they, they work like King Solomon. You know, people came all around the world to look at the beauty and the wisdom. And, and the Philistines are going, what? What's wrong with those people? They're ashamed. <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot of things. We should think about that. A nation that... Um, it was built in many ways, a Christian worldview, probably more of a Calvinistic worldview, but still a, a theocratic worldview, one that was, you know, acknowledged God in the foundation and saw his wisdom. So, yeah. That's one thing I'm seeing more about the culture. And since I've been doing so much study in the Old Testament, when I see this stuff, the word that comes to mind is Canaanite. Mm -hmm. You say, well, everybody stuck with everybody because they fell in love. Um, you just, you just, you know, I can't help who I love. Well, maybe so. It doesn't mean you got to sleep with them, right? And you just, you just see that just increasing exponentially in America. So, yeah. So, yeah. Also, Rich point, you have played the whore with the Assyrians. Assyrians are the ones that wiped out the, the northern kingdom, right? And now you're going after their gods too. Wait, it's bad enough you picked up the Canaanite gods. Now you go after the Egyptian gods and you're going after the Assyrian gods because you were ins insatiable. Yeah, you have played the harlot with them and could not be satisfied. Therefore, thou hast moreover multiplied your fornication to the land of Canaan unto Chaldea. Chaldea, that's Babylon. And of course, the Babylonians are promised to come invade. But this word Chaldea here is really talking about merchants of Chaldea, merchants, tradesmen. So the kind of the picture here is you even sleep with the traveling salesmen that come from Babylon. Okay. It is people just show up total strangers and you sleep with them too. The Can and the Chaldea, and yet you are still not satisfied therewith. How weak is your heart, says the Lord God. Seeing that you do all of these things, the work of an imperious, whorish woman. <clears throat> Again, God is describing Israel and asking Ezekiel's audience of men, how would you feel if your wife were doing that? Okay, maybe you can get a picture of how I feel about my wife doing that. God is saying, you seem to think that I should let this go. I should continue to ignore it. I should uh, uh, just restore them. And we're going to see legally, ultimately, why he cannot. But he's, he's trying to build a very impassioned and shocking picture. 
He says, look, your wife's doing this and this, and she's seeking after that, and she's acting like this. And that's, that's, what, that's what my wife's been doing. How would you feel if your wife did that? And again, it's ugly. So how weak is your heart? Verse 31, once again, in that you build your eminent places in the head of every way and makes your high place in every street. And it's not been, okay, he's saying it again. You've been putting all these shrines and other gods there. And he says, and you have not been as a harlot in that you scorneth higher. He says, you're not a normal prostitute because you don't even ask for pay. You're scorning higher. Now, nah, don't give me any money. I'll just sleep with you anyway. Okay, he's saying you're not like a normal harlot. He says, <clears throat> he says um, you're not like a normal prostitute because you refuse payment. They give gifts to their whores. Verse thirty-two or thirty-three. I'm, I'm sorry, verse thirty-two. But as a wife that commits adultery, which takes strangers instead of her husband. So in other words, she just is willing to treat every man like a husband, giving away for free. Verse 30, they give gifts to their whores, but you give your gifts to your lovers. They're saying, you know what, in most situations, the John pays for your services, but in this case, you're paying them to sleep with you. You're giving up your gifts. Um, this happened almost directly in 2 Kings 16, 18. King Ahaz stripped the gold and silver mm -hmm. out of the temple to pay tribute to the king of Assyria. Mm -hmm. He says, here, we're going to go ahead and give you our gold, our silver, so we can like commit spiritual adultery with your gods. <clears throat> and you can see some other pictures. Hosea, remember Hosea taught was told to marry a prostitute as an example. Hosea is previous and he would have pertained more to the northern kingdom. But it's still... <clears throat> Uh, adulterous wife giving to strangers what belonged to her husband. Verse 24, and the contrary is in you from other women of your whoredoms. Whereas none followed you to commit whoredoms, and in that you give a reward. No reward is given unto thee, therefore you are contrary. In other words, once again, that's not the way whoring is supposed to work. You're supposed to be charging for it, and you're paying people to do it, okay? Therefore, O harlot, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, because your filthiness was poured out and your nakedness discovered through your whoredoms with your lovers and with all the idols of your abominations and by the blood of your children, which thou didst give unto them. So mm -hmm. since you're guilty of adultery and murder, this makes it personal because all of a sudden we're talking about Ten Commandments stuff, right? And you didn't look at it. Sometimes uh, Judge Marilyn, People's Court, a person will give a defense and they'll say, here's why I did it. And Judge Marilyn will reword the defense to show what really is going on. And then she'll say, that doesn't sound good when I say it, right? Because she's exposing the hypocrisy of someone saying that. Uh, what was the guy who... Um, well, I broke down the door because she wouldn't let me in. So, oh, in other words, you decided to vandalize her place because her property didn't, didn't respect her property. So, that sounds good when I say it, right? Yeah, God is saying, you need to look at this from my perspective. <clears throat> so, verse 37, Behold, therefore I will gather all your lovers with whom thou hast taken pleasure, and all of them which you have loved, with all of them which, you, which thou hast hated, and I will even gather them round about against thee. It's strange because when we love with the world's love, it turns into hatred. Mm -hmm. I'm probably getting the name wrong, but it was Ab and Tam uh, Tamar. Yeah. Yeah. It says, oh, love. And weirdly enough, the word love in the Septuagint is um, agape. Which means in that context and the older version of that meaning was um, just unconditional passion. But in, in that case, obviously, you know, when you get what you want and it's not godly, you disdain it. You know. I actually use that as a devil. Mm. That's 
<laughs> so yeah, and it's just it's funny because you know the world does not satisfy, and when you get what you want, it's always diminishing returns, and the, the it's um, and of course if a person has no alternative, they have to try it again, and that's the that's the nature of addiction. That's the nature of of the world, and so I hear what it says: the lovers that you love that you actually hated. Well, yeah. That's why you saw a second, a third, and fourth, and five thousandth mm -hmm. lover is because you hated the last one. Mm -hmm. You have to always keep going. Verse 30, and I will judge you as women that break wedlock and shed blood are judged. Okay. What was the purpose of this, this entire sordid, shocking attempt to get your attention? Um, Ten commandments have been broken here. Adultery and murder. Mm -hmm. And my wife is guilty of it. What should I do? Right? Yeah. Shed blood. Well, stoning, right? And then verse 39, and it says, And I will also give unto you into their hand, and they shall throw down your eminent places. They're going to throw down your, your shrines and break down your high places, and they will strip you of your clothes and shall take your fair jewels and leave thee naked and bare. In other words, leave you the way I found you. Wow. Which. Mm -hmm. in application here can be very, very, very merciful. We can think of situations and maybe even individuals that they had to hit rock bottom. They were saved. They were loved by God. They had a great calling and testimony and even ministry and then something went wrong and they, you know, had to hit rock bottom. We can probably think of one or two people that we're praying for right now that were saying, if they have to hit rock bottom, Lord, so be it. You know, mm -hmm. hand them over to Satan so they can be, you know, so they can be rescued. And we're not talking about losing salvation, obviously. We're talking about saved people. Again, Israel was saved at the Red Sea as a type of person, right? That whole, that whole history. They were saved in Egypt. In the, the, they're covered by the blood. They were baptized at the Red Sea. They went through the wilderness era and then they were brought into the land of, of promise and, and faithfulness. God did it all. And the second we start thinking that we contributed something, that's when the problem is. You know, anybody say, you know what? I'm pretty smart now. I got this. No, no, you're in big trouble. You know, oh, I got extra music or I got pick, pick a talent or skill or anything you do. And you start thinking you did it on your own. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar learned the hard way. It's not a safe path. Okay. Mm -hmm. And as a result, verse 40, they shall also bring up a company against you, and they shall stone you with stones and thrust you through with their swords. Stoning is the proper response for mm -hmm. adultery and swords is judgment for idolatry and murder, right? The avenger of blood for murder. Mm -hmm. Verse 41. And they shall burn your house with fire and execute judgment upon me in the sight of many women. So you, Israel, are the harlot and you're being judged. And the other countries are the other women. Okay. And we're going to talk about two specific women at the end of the chapter here. But um, the, the women are standing around going, what got into you, Jerusalem? You know, you were so beautiful. You were so smart. You were the envy of the world. And we learned that your God was not to be messed with. I mean, even at the time of Jonah, Ninevites were like, oh, we heard about what happened in Egypt. We better not mess with him. You know, so they have a vested interest in respecting Yahweh. And they're just shocked that why would you do this to the best husband on the planet? So women, the other women, other nations are going to watch you. And I will cease the verse 41 in the middle from playing the harlot, and you shall give no hire anymore. This prophecy is fulfilled because when they came back from Babylon, when Persia sent them back home, idolatry is gone. Idolatry is no longer a problem for Israel. They have other problems. Um, the only thing you might call idolatry is by the time of Christ, they were treating the temple itself like it was some sort of good luck charm. Mm -hmm. And, of course, even today, Judaism often 
Judaism is the God, the religion, it can be their God sometimes. You know, that's, that's they, they, they serve and worship that institution and ignoring the creator. But this did, this did happen, it did work. When God brought them back, there's no more idolatry, no more other gods. It's, um, it's also prophesied in Hosea as well. Verse 42, so will I make my fury toward thee to rest, and my jealousy shall depart from thee, and I will be quiet and will be no more angry. So God's saying there's a purpose for this. Once again, the God of the Bible is not capricious. Doesn't just lose his temper and go nuts and wipe out a bunch of people. No, he has reasons for everything he does. He's in control the whole time. He doesn't lose his temper. And he has an end. Idolatry and murder and perversion must be purged from his wife, his people. And it will be. And it has been in many ways. And it will continue to be. And we'll see that as it ends up here. Verse 43, why? Because you did not remember the day of your youth. Once again, you didn't remember where you came from. But you fretted me, you worried me, and all these things. <laughs> God's saying, you know what? You annoyed me. You made me have to do this. Or her parents say that. You made me. It hurts, it hurts me worse than it hurts you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The parents said, you know, you're forcing my hand. Therefore, I also will recompense your way upon your head, says the Lord God, and you shall not commit this lewdness above all your abominations. Verse 44. Behold, everyone that uses Proverbs shall say, use this proverb against you, saying, as is a mother, so is her daughter. So let's just Americanize that. Like mother, like daughter. Okay? Daughter is going to be like her mom. And so if people use that proverb, they're going to use it against Israel. Why? Well, because your mother's an Amorite, right? Probably the Hittite, if I didn't get those confused. Uh, your mother, so everyone's going to look and say, yep, that's what happens. Now, Jerusalem, if you go back far enough, probably was Salem, where Melchizedek came from. And that's close enough to the time of Noah and Shem that the knowledge of God was with them. So... That initial incursion into Canaan by Canaanites, you know, Melchizedek came from that. Some people, they, some people knew God, right? And they went bad. So just like they went bad and became the Canaanites we think about today, so Israel has done the same thing. Israel has gone just as bad, but they're without excuse because they have the word. Remember, again, that's like in the first couple chapters of Romans, where uh, when the pagans and the atheists do bad things is one thing. But when you have God's word and God's covenant, that's an extra accountability there. Like mother, like daughter, for you are your mother's daughter. Verse 45, that loathed her husband and her children. Right? You're an Amorite. So it's, this is God speaking to J Israel, you know, in real human historical language, right? Experientially, use that phrase. And you're the sister of your sisters, which loathed their husbands and their children. Your mother was a Hittite, your father was an Amorite. I did get it backwards. Your elder sister is Samaria. She and her daughter is that dwell at thy left hand, and your younger sister that dwells at your right hand is Sodom and her daughters. So left and right hand here in this case is talking about a map. In the ancient world at this time, maps, east was at the top. For whatever arbitrary reason, east is on top. And you, there's a couple other things like the ladder of the camp. When you do that, you can see certain things in that. But as a result, if east is at the top, that means that um, north is on the left and south is on the right. Everybody see that? Turn the map sideways in your head. So on the left is Samaria, to the right is Sodom. Or, on the other side. So God is going to talk about Samaria and Sodom, two notoriously wicked nations. Sodom is probably the most famous. Remember, Jesus had to apologize to them. He said, you know, if he didn't he say, if Sodom were here, they would have believed. You guys are in bigger trouble because you didn't believe. Um, so, yeah, uh, Matthew 10, 15. Jesus said, I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that city. You know, 
So he's saying these two phrases, everybody in Israel knows Sodom and Samaria, they're the worst of the worst. Sodom because of their perversion and Samaria because of their, at this point, they're the half-breeds. They don't have their, they're the results of fornication. Of course, the, you know, the Syrians, the Samar like Samaritan woman, despised by the Jews because the half-breeds. It was a racist thing there. So again, Ezekiel's listeners are hearing that. He says, but verse 70, 47, you didn't walk after their ways. You didn't, you didn't go after their abominations. That almost sounds positive, right? Imagine he started saying, he says, you're not as bad as them. You're worse. <laughs> exactly what it says here. But you didn't walk in their ways. You didn't go after their abominations. But as if that were a little thing, you was corrupted more than they in all thy ways. And that's exactly. You're not as bad as them. You're worse. No, you're not like them. You're worse than them. So this is shock value. Again, the listeners are going, their jaws are dropping. This is just a nonstop verbal abusive R-rated tirade that Ezekiel is pouring out as God's giving him these words. This is God speaking to Ezekiel. Verse 40, as I live, says the Lord God, Sodom, your sister has not done. She know her daughters thou hast done, thou and thy daughters, because behold, this is the iniquity of your sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness that was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. This is extra information about Sodom. We understand the sexual perversion in Sodom in the story, and that, of course, wasn't a great crime and affront to God. But that was the social and cultural real, um, outcome of a very prosperous city. Remember when Lot looked at Sodom, it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. This is one of the shiningest, most beautiful cities out there at the time. You know, the artwork was great. All the interior decorating was top notch. Um, prosperous, lots of idle free time. Everything was going great, but there was no care for the poor. And it's no side of the coin. People will use this verse to say that sodomy was not the issue. That's not true. You have to really twist things to make that work but it's another side of the coin verse 15 they were haughty and committed abomination before me there it is therefore i took them away as i saw fit as i saw fit good god's saying i see an abomination i can wipe it out your sisters did that i took them out and you're worse than them Neither has Samaria committed half of your sins. We have multiplied your abominations more than they, and has justified your sisters in all your abominations. Justified, that means your abominations are so bad, you made them look good. You justified them. You know what? We thought Sodom and Samaria were bad, but after watching Jerusalem and Israel, they're not so bad after all. This is the relative righteous, obviously, but justifying them. Thou also, which has judged your sisters, see, you're worse than them, and you judge them. You judge their sisters. You bear your own shame for your sins that thou hast committed more abominable than they. They are more righteous than you. Yea, be thou confounded also. Bear your shame. That's right. Be overwhelmed. Be crushed. Be confused. Bear your shame in that you have justified your sisters again. You've made your sisters look good. When I shall bring again their captivity, the captivity of Sodom and her daughters, and the captivity of Samaria and her daughters, then, listen to this, will I bring again the captivity of your captives in the midst of them? In other words, a time is coming when, when you're captive, these other captives are going to look at you. Sodom and Samaria are going to look at you, and they're going to be shocked. And they're going to be upset and amazed. Verse 34, that you may bear your own shame and may be confounded in all that you have done, in that you are a comfort unto them. There is an element, we're going to read the next couple of verses here, where the worst of the worst have some hope. God promises to restore Sodom and Samaria in some fashion, some manner that no one really understands how it could work. It could just be symbols for, for Gentiles, you know, the world, but God's God has a plan to restore this planet. God has a plan to, to um, you know, make all things new. And he's saying that when Sodom and Samaria watch me 
restore you, Jerusalem, they'll know they have hope. Because you were worse. Sodom and Samaria, the nations of the world will look and say, wow, God restored Israel. There's hope for me. If God can restore Israel, if he can restore anybody. Remember in um, Isaiah, one of the servant songs, God says, restoring Israel, is, that's too easy. I'm going to restore the world. I'm going to bring salvation to the entire world. So, <clears throat> you are comforted in 5, verse 55, when your sister Sodom and her daughters shall return to their former estate, and Samaria and her daughters will return to their former estate, then you and your daughters shall return to your former estate. God will restore. I think the, can the, the canker worm has eaten. For your sister Sodom was not mentioned by the mouth in the day of your pride. You know, you were proud. You said you're better than Sodom. It's not the case. Before your wickedness was discovered, as at the time of your reproach of the daughters of Syria, all of that are around about her, the daughters of the Philistines, which despised thee round about. Once again, this is a part more of a prophecy here. When Jerusalem was destroyed, the Edomites and Philistines were excited about it. There was unholy glee among them. So we're, we're, we're stepping back here to a more short-term prophecy. to saying that when I destroy Jerusalem, some of the other, these other nations are going to be happy to see it. And it'll make sense to them. It may not make sense to you, but even the world understands this. Verse 38, thou has borne your lewdness and your abomination, says the Lord. You are accountable. You're carrying the weight of this. For thus says the Lord, chapter 59, I will even deal with thee as you have done, which has despised the oath in breaking the covenant. You broke the covenant. I'm keeping my covenant. My covenant is to destroy you when you broke it. I'm keeping my word. The theme throughout all this book is God says, I will be glorified. I'd rather be glorified by prospering you, but if you won't let me be glorified that way, I will be glorified by destroying you. But I will be glorified because I keep my word. I keep my word. We made a deal at Sinai. We made a deal with Moses. You all agreed to do it. Um, you know, read Deuteronomy 28 and 29 and see if God hasn't kept his word throughout all of human history. Nevertheless, verse 60, got in on a positive note. I know it's eight o'clock, but we got to do this. I will remember my covenant with thee in the days of your youth. What is God's covenant with Israel in the days of her youth? The covenant with Abraham. That's the covenant that's unconditioned. That's the covenant that does not depend upon how Abraham or his ancestors act or behave. It's a covenant, a unilateral covenant that promises the descendants, the land, and the people will be God's. I'm going to remember that covenant for the days you, and I will establish unto thee an everlasting covenant. Mm -hmm. So this is a promise that when, when part of my restoration process is going to make a covenant that's eternal. Mm -hmm. Even the Abrahamic covenant is temporal in this sense. Don't get me wrong here. It deals with the planet Earth. Okay. And as a result, the Jewish religion and the Jewish end game is the millennial kingdom you know the reign on earth and messiah reigns on earth but it's still an earth-based system it doesn't really focus on heaven it doesn't focus on eternity so this new covenant to our glory mm -hmm. to our rejoicing focuses on everlasting eternity then thou shalt remember your ways and be ashamed when you will receive your sisters you're older and you're younger and i will give unto thee your four daughters but not by your covenant. I got a brand new covenant. Guess what? The old covenant is not going to restore your family. The old covenant is not going to make the weak, wicked nations godly. The old covenant, the law, is not going to heal you spiritually. The old covenant can maybe get you to behave right, but let's face it. They had it and it didn't. The law does not create good. The law does not create success. The law does not create godliness in any way. It just exposes horrible need. And everything we've talked about tonight, 
Um, if your stomach churned a little bit or you got a little embarrassed, well, that just demonstrates the gravity of the need. It's horrendous. Mm -hmm. And I will give any I will establish my covenant with thee, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Remember, God says, you're going to know I'm the Lord. And the new covenant is obviously the one you'll know I'm the Lord because of the glory. Mm -hmm. The glory of the new covenant, the unconditional love, the the total propitiation for sin. Mm -hmm. Everything's paid for. Um, unlimited atonement. Mm -hmm. I say it out there right. There's so many movements today attacking that. Unlimited atonement. Totally paid for. The blood of Christ cancels all sin mm -hmm. and all judgment has been erased completely. That is the covenant that allows God's Holy Spirit to move on the inside mm -hmm. and give us the power to live godly. The law mm -hmm. cannot do that. Never could. It was never meant to. Verse 63, that you may remember and be confounded and never open your mouth anymore because of your shame. That's a different type of confounded there. Remember, uh, Job says, I shut my mouth. Yeah. And this is saying that there's going to become a time, Jerusalem, prophecy of Jerusalem, when you're going to be confounded because you have no memory of your shame. You, Someone's going to say, give me, give me your history. You're going to say, Oh, God married me and gave me this beautiful city and we're reigning forever. The sort of details will be gone. They're washed away, covered by the blood. That history doesn't exist. Everything we read today is experiential, not positional, especially for our application today. We can learn from it and we can, you know, in our own private thoughts, we go, yeah, that, that kind of was me. Thank God. Again, the law is designed to make you of sin conscious. Well, the, 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 the law is designed to make you sin conscious, whereas in the gospel, we're, we're called to be Christ conscious. In Christ consciousness, we don't. The memory's gone. It's purged. And God says, therefore, I will be pacified towards thee for all you have done, says the Lord. What pacified God with sin? It was the cross, right? Mm -hmm. The cross pacified God. God had serious moral issues with all of us, with humanity. And it rose up and was is something that a holy God cannot tolerate. Couldn't handle it, getting worse and worse and worse. Every day that God gives patience, makes it build up and makes it worse. Finally, the day came when all of that pent of moral rage was able to be poured out on one guilty person. And that's wow. the person who volunteered to be guilty for us. The person who knew no sin became sin. And that's our foundation for our new and eternal covenant. Mm -hmm. Because now, this is a prophecy here about that day that's coming when God will be pacified. And now he has been when it comes to sin. The only judgment left on this planet is the anger that God now has for those rejecting his son, yeah. rejecting the, the process of pacification that is the only way to God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and pray. That's the end of the chapter. Thanks for sticking with it. Mm -hmm. Lord Jesus, <laughs> we just thank you so much for this intense word here. Help us to use it to understand where we've come from, understand the incredible mercy and grace and love you have shown us, and to help us realize uh, the gravity of this situation. It's not an easy thing. You don't just wink at sin. You don't just ignore it. It is offensive, but you dealt with it. So God, we thank you for this time. Just bless those of us who are, are listening. Give us some. Um, safe travels and good health. Uh, we pray for those that are um, not feeling well tonight, God. Again, we look for healing, look for your creative power to come in and do restoration in people's bodies and minds right now. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 That's devastating. Hey, yeah. Was yeah. Yeah. Uh, Denise, go ahead. Mm. 
Right. No, no, the, um, the goal of grace, which teaches us godliness, is to give us the power, the ability, and the desire to keep God's commandments. Yeah, yeah, obviously, we don't throw that. I mean, We've joked with that in the past. Oh, we're not under the law. I can start killing. You know, not under the law. I can start, you know, uh, the exception there would be Sabbath because that was designated for a sign for the Jews. But of course, even then, Christ is our Sabbath and we keep Sabbath by, by it's a seven day affair there. Um, but yeah, the law as it, as it stands cannot lead to salvation. The law only shows the need for salvation. But no, we don't throw it out at all. Christ didn't come to do Christ didn't come to destroy the law, he came to fulfill it. And now we have the power through Christ to not only not steal, but not want to steal, not kill, but not even want to kill, you know, usually most days, you know. Galatians 3, 18, 19, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is not our promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then saith the law, it was added because of transgression, so the seed should come, right. which is Jesus, mm -hmm. to whom the promise was made. The promise was made to Jesus. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of the mediator. Yeah. It was given to show sin because after the promise was given to Abraham, they were not. But they asked for it too because I'm not. Well, at Mount Sinai, when they heard God's voice, they said, oh, I don't hear that voice again. We want a mediator. We want, we'd rather hear from a man. So at that point, that killed a personal relationship between God and people in, in a national context. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go ahead and sign off here on Zoom. Everybody, Valerie's on live. You want to holler and say hi to her? Hey, Valerie. Thanks for the <laughs> Okay. Hey. See y'all. See you, Stuart. Thank you. God bless. It's a real in. blessing. My brother-in-law keeps coming on, and it just, it just blows me away that my brother-in-law. Okay, fine. Hi. 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 I see you, Jermaine. That's Valerie. Okay. Well, we'll see y'all later. God bless. We got dessert. Bye.